everyone always asks me, how did you get into running? And nobody ever talks about how do you plan to get out of running? And I guess that's because if you're keeping this on a hobby or an amateur basis and it's very much recreational activity for you, you never need to stop running. And hopefully I will never stop running. I love it. It makes me happy. Mentally, it makes me insanely happy, but I enjoy the physical and physical, physiological benefits as well. And so it's, for me, it's the perfect activi activity. I look forward to it every day. But I guess the, the, how did you get into running is much more interesting because, oh, you mean you were at a stage where you couldn't run 400 meters and then all of a sudden you put some training in place and you can win races and, and then you can you know, run for England and Great Britain and, and do the 221 and for the marathon and, and run quick times and then run a fast 100K. And that's a much easier story to tell and also an easier story to hear because usually you're people who are listening to that story are at that stage where they want to make those gains as well. The part that I've been battling with for definitely the last two years, but I, you'd, I'd have to say going into COVID, when, when we went into COVID, I, I always had this idea when I got into running that, okay, it's 2010, I love this, but I'm rubbish at it. How do I get better? Okay, I, I'm getting better, brilliant, I'm seeing these gains. How do I do this full time? Because the only way to compete with the very best in the world, at the time for me, I was looking up to Anton Kropitschka and, and Killian, and they, Killian's still at the top of his game. And I'm looking at these guys and thinking, how do I win 100K and 100 mile races? And my only thought was, you've got to be all in which is exactly the name of the channel. You've got to be all in and you've got to give it 110% of your focus. And so when I saved up enough and backed myself to go full time, I then made all the mistakes. And I've, I've said this before where I, I thought more training is going to make faster athlete. And it wasn't the case. It was better recovery, better sleep, more reduced stress because you're not doing 50, 60 hours a day in the, uh, a week in the, in the, in the, in the office. And, and therefore that kind of focus can be entirely on you getting better physiologically and physically and becoming a better athlete. And then I went, you know, it, it very quickly within seven months of me saying, okay, I'm going to back myself. I got taken on by sponsors and then it became a professional gig and it's been over 10 years. But when we went into COVID, I guess what I didn't appreciate was I'd carved out this life for myself where I when I'm all in, I'm all in. And so it's like, okay, well, where do the best people live? Where do the best runners in the world live? And where, where are the best trails and where are the best races? And, and so I often tell the story about Subido or Pico Valletta. For me, it's the best race in the world. It's the toughest race in the world. If I can get better at that race, I'm going to be better at all races. So I literally relocated and, went and moved to Granada and then spent the years transitioning from one place to the other to get the very best out of my body. So mountains in Chiang Mai, mountains in Granada and became really good at running uphill, but really good in all running. You know, there's a village not too far away from Granada where you're racing everybody. But there's like two guys who have run 220 for the marathon, which is a high level for a Spanish athlete. And, um, and so for me, it made total sense. And I guess what I didn't realize, when we moved into COVID, things started to get uh, cancelled and postponed and, and at first it's you know it's disappointing and, and there was an area if you remember that we didn't know when this we were going to come out of this and we, there was talk even that it, this might continue for decades and, and all that was wild talk looking back and even the way we tackled it was probably pretty wild but what I saw was people were very extrinsically motivated and so because they didn't have races and times to aim at and trophies to win and medals they stopped training or they reduced dramatically the training. For me, it was an opportunity because I loved the process so much. It was an opportunity to get better. And so I trained harder than ever. And I spoke because I saw it as an opportunity. I can get a top nutritionist from the UK on the phone. I can get a sports nutritionist from massive fo football clubs from the UK on the phone, on a video call and, and pick their brains. I can interview top performing athletes in different sports and find out the mentality of, of, of the winner. And so there was eight different areas, including exercise, physiology, and strength, condition, and nutrition, et cetera, where I thought, if I can just raise by 1%, I'm gonna be a completely different athlete. And so that's six hours and 40 minutes for the 100K that I ran, I'm gonna be able to break the British record, which is 619, 620. And then I'm moving on to the world record, and then I'm gonna go for the world record and win the world championships in the same race. And that was my goal. I haven't achieved it, and I think, Although I worked harder in COVID and I saw results as soon as we got out of it, 
you know, one, one of my favorite races is Passatore race and always has been in, in Italy. I managed to win that in 2022. And, you know, I remember crossing the finish line and think, thinking I had six or seven goals going into this, what I wanted to do. And this was one of them. And it's a massive tick in the box. And it's brilliant, but I've still got stuff to do. I still want to get the world record. I still want to get the British record. I still want to get the world uh, title for 100K. And, and then we still were kind of in and out of COVID. I guess this is 2020, 2020 the start of 2022. And, and I'm, training to get a, I'm trying to get a, a Western States golden ticket from Tarawara Ultramarathon in New Zealand. I'm training like a madman in Chiang Mai. I'm doing all the stuff. I'm doing exactly the right training. I think the course record is pretty weak. So I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going there with the thought that I'm going to break the course record, win the race, and then get into... Uh, get into Western States and then just literally move over there and run the course constantly in California so that I'm as prepared as possible. And at the very last moment, this race was cancelled for internationals and then cancelled completely in New Zealand. And so I, I ended up with, and this was confidence at the time for me. But when I look back, I took a flight from, from Chiang Mai to Bangkok, Bangkok to Dubai, Dubai to somewhere in North America, North, somewhere like San Francisco to... Um, across to Arizona, it was 35, 36 hours. And I was exhausted when I got to this race, Black Canyons. And it was looking, I thought it was confidence, just thinking I can check the course and yeah, I'm okay, I'll probably win that and I'll probably get that golden ticket in that race. Complete arrogance. I had no idea of the course, I had no idea of the surface and it was literally like a completely different type of running. For me, it was like a track athlete never running cross country before and going to an Edinburgh cross country in January in the mud. It was like a different sport altogether. And I remember being, I think five miles into it and falling, hitting my knee badly and twisting my ankle. And it was the ankle more than anything because I couldn't run. And the, the options that I had were either walk back to the start line where it's, you know, there's, your car is at the finish line, your support is at the next checkpoint, which is 15 miles away and or hobble 15 miles and get to your checkpoint and you know let them know what's going on hopefully it will improve within that time I'd already decided with like a, a deep reflection similar to the times that I was cycle touring in Asia and decided to I want to start running similar to the times that I was hiking in the Himalayas decided you're running and you're on the right path but you're not giving it the attention it deserves and so you need to go all in and then you need to save up and back yourself and go for it it was like an awakening like that. And I don't know whether I was justifying it to myself or whether it was an, e and whether it, I was justifying it and whether it was an easy out or whether it made total sense. But there was something in me that, and I, funnily enough, I just got a cat and he's my world. And, and you feel very kind of responsible for, for an animal. And it may be in a, a similar way to, to what you do as a child, but there was this sense of, okay, you've lived the perfect life for the last 10 years and all and all of a sudden you have some responsibility you have accountability and and, and therefore you I, I had this big sense of you need to make more money and so you need to go back to work and you need to work alongside running and you can manage those two just don't go too heavy on the work and i completely tricked myself because before i'd even left america and we're talking like three four days later i'd already made three phone calls to people that i used to work with and set up for me to be working, thinking I could do it on a part-time basis, maybe work 30, 30 hours a week and, and commit all my time. It didn't work and it doesn't work. And for me, I, have to, I had to be all in. And, and then there was, you know, thrown into all of that, there was Brexit. And so you've got this decision where, you, where are you going to be? And it, it made sense for me, okay, I'm halfway between my work and I'm halfway between... Uh, t between races in Europe and therefore I'm going to be in, in Dubai and that makes total sense at the moment and I'm, I'm thinking I need a base and again it's this kind of maybe it's maturity maybe it's responsibility accountability whatever but I made a choice because it was no longer easy enough to be wherever I wanted in the EU wherever I wanted in Europe as a British citizen and so again maybe I justified it I didn't push hard enough but what essentially I'd done is completely taken for granted my perfect days, like the most amazing moments that I can think about from running. If you ask me about my top five, it's, it's not winning a race or setting a course record or whatever, or, you know, representing your country. It's literally the sound of the river to my favorite route going from the center of Granada 
out to a place at the start of the mountain and just following the river, so like two, three percent up all the way. And I can just hear the river all the way on a weekday when nobody else is on the trail. Those are my favorite moments, stopping at a natural fountain and drinking water, and then knowing that I'm gonna go on for the next two, three hours, and I'm just li li literally linking up natural fountain, which, which is the most delicious water you can ever taste, because it's mountain water. Those are my favorite moments. And I underestimated, I think I took for granted just how much that meant to me, and just how much the freedom of literally being in, in a place, it would be usually October, if I had no race in October or November, it would be like, okay, wh what's the weather looking for, like for the next 10 days? If it was bad weather in Granada, which it sometimes can be in October and uh, April, I would just be like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm just getting on a flight, I'm going to Chiang Mai. I'm going to like just pack up my bike and, and mainly it was the cycling. You can go out and run for two, three hours, no problem at all in the rain or in bad weather, but you can't do that on a bike. It becomes a little bit more, and I sound soft because I'm from the north of England when I say this, but it, it's just, it's a, it's a ball like being on the bike for four hours when you're in the rain, when you're getting wet and the different layers are getting wet and you're having to think about what you're wearing. When I got a ride in Granada or Chiang Mai, I don't even wear a shirt. I just have like enough, about $10 in my, in my bike, bike pump, enough to, and just go for as long as I want. And so that level of freedom always really appealed to me, both where I was living, the variation, and that extra cross sport, which allowed me to you know, gain extra volume and, and do extra and, and make this more sustainable. Keep that longevity because I wasn't putting as much pressure on, on, my, uh, on my body as a typical runner who's done 100 miles a week. And so, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I, I think as a pro athlete, you, you underestimate what, what it's gonna be like, the transition out, and what that is actually gonna feel like when you stop competing. And there was something in me when I won the race in, in Pasatura that thought, okay, I think, I, th I think that might be it. And um, I trained for the World Championships that year because I thought, I'm in decent shape already, I can improve on that. Got back to Dubai, June, July, August, ridiculously hot. We're obviously at the end of August now. It's insane. I went out today for an easy run and my heart rate was um, into zone three and, I, and I'm running five minutes per kilometer pace. And, and that's not necessarily, it is partly a lack of fitness, but it's just so hot. You cannot like go, you, ha you have to literally stop and walk in order for it to make sense. And so you spend a lot of time on a treadmill. And what that's meant for me is this year, I relocated to, Chiang Mai again, because I thought the only way to make my work and the running work and it all to come together is for me to have seven hours on the UK. And so that's what I'm gonna do. And, um, and six hours on Europe. And so I can do my, my training in the morning and in the afternoon, I can do, and it, what, what I, it's maybe it's a hot climate and training in a hot climate. What I failed to, appreciate is when you're going hard in a hot climate and when you're really pushing it, you are wiped out for the rest of the day. So it might take 20% of your time, but then to get on, I tricked myself when I said I was gonna work part-time. I'm all in on both things and therefore it's not gonna work. And luckily enough, I've got myself to a point now where, and this is the good part, I've got myself to, and it makes me insanely happy as well. I, uh, I've got myself to a point where I can oversee that because it wasn't just work, it was building a business. And that's now at a point where I can oversee that and, and I can focus on what I really love to do, which is run fast, coach athletes, and really kind of training camps and, and make the best possible race experiences for people, as well as myself being like a semi-competitive athlete and so what I decided to do is like, okay, let's, let's start this with a bang and let's try and run Abu Dhabi Marathon quick. So that's 15 and a half weeks from now. So the, my start point right now, I started a park run a couple of weeks ago uh, or a park run all in run club and that's 5K time run. I did that at the weekend. My heart rate was kind of like in the 160s on the final kilometer, which was I think 340 or 350. So what I'm trying, going to try to do is run that in a respectable time. And I will show you behind the scenes stuff of how I'm training towards that, what the sessions look like. I'll give you a weekly update and hopefully it will add some depth to the channel and hopefully give you something that maybe you feel as if you're not seeing anywhere. But for me, I, the reason I love The Last Dance was because I'm seeing behind the scenes. I'm seeing stuff, and I'm not comparing myself to Michael Jordan, but I'm seeing stuff that 
wow, I, I wanted to be Michael Jordan before I saw this documentary, but he's a nutter. Um, and the same thing with the Ronnie documentary. <laughs> wow, what does he put himself through in order to get to, to be in Ronnie O'Sullivan and being so great for three, four decades? Uh, and I, so hopefully I can show you behind the scenes and not just how the racing looks, but how the training looks and what the diet looks like and what the nutrition plan looks like. I'm really going into detail because I'm not in the total headspace of a professional athlete that's trying to win the world championship just yet. Let's see where we get to at the end of December and then see what's available for next year. But I'm not in that headspace right now, so it gives me a little bit of time to sort of get fit, get myself in, a, put myself in a good place physically and physiologically. Mentally, I'm in a great place and then show you along the way what it actually looks like and have the time to do that and not be thinking, well, if you can't take a photo or if you can't take an interview right now, I've got to run because I'm on a training session. It doesn't need to be like that. I can kind of, I can talk you through it. So that's a long-winded version of, I'm gonna do the Abu Dhabi Marathon in 15 and a half weeks in the middle of December. If anybody wants to sign up for it, I'm going to put together a group pretty soon. What I'm also gonna do is there's a 10 mile race in about five, six weeks that I will do and I'll try to sort of hit marathon target pace for that 10 mile race. That will be in October. So we'll see on the temperatures for that, but hopefully it calms down once we get to October. And then I'm gonna go for a KOM uh, up two local mountains. One of them is 12, 12 kilometers. So it's like 57, 56 minutes all out effort. And one is 20 kilometers that I've got the KOM for already. I think that's something like 126 or 127, up five and a half percent, up a mountain called Jabal Jace. So we'll go for Jabal Jace, Jabal means mountain in um, Arabic, and a, and a mountain called Jabal Hafit, which is the 12K, which is much more steep. I think it's 6.5 or 7%, so it's a different type of running. So what I'll show you is how I specifically train for each race, what those training sessions look like, what they feel like, and what I feel like afterwards. I'll show you the heart rate graphs and what the heart rate is doing so that you can correlate that stuff to what your sessions look like. And here's the thing, although we've got to train with specificity, you, you can apply the same principles to anything. You've got to work on your speed, you've got to work on your joints, and it culminates in hopefully the most trained athlete that you can be in a period of time. So 15 and a half weeks to go, um, and the next two and a half weeks is literally prepping me for that 13 week uh, cycle, so get myself in, Peak condition, as I always say to you, 13 weeks is a perfect amount of time, three months to really go at that. And hopefully we'll show you some stuff around the race as well. Because as the channel grows, I never expected this. Somebody said to me just yesterday, I, lo I love how you put the same principles in place for YouTube. And it's, it, I put the same principles in place for anything I do. I know I'm not the most talented. I, I can't edit a video. I couldn't edit a video in any shape, way, shape, or form when I started. I had no idea about algorithms and stuff that goes behind. All that stuff is available to learn. It's just that you need to put in the reps. So my mentality was, if you do a video every day, hopefully you'll get better at the delivery. And then maybe people will come back. Maybe some people are on your side. But I didn't expect it to be thousands of people. I expected it to be more like, a, here's how you do it, because I, I coached kids. And when you, you, when you have a, a class of 25 kids, 10 are persuaded to do it by the parents and, uh, and teachers, 15 are really in it. And you know, of those 15, as I've talked about the different groups, but maybe five really want it. Whereas if you're tuning in and watching a YouTube channel, and if you subscribe, I guess you really want it and you really want to get faster. And to be honest with you, and I, I say that, but I am always honest with you, but if it wasn't for YouTube and the kind of the energy that I get back in the comments, I probably wouldn't want to do this. And so, yeah, I, mean, I have YouTube to thank for that and, and you guys, so thanks a lot. Uh, and if you have any questions, if you want to tell me what you're training for, please pop it in the comments below. And if you got anything from these videos, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.